So I have to pleasure, the pleasure to introduce to you the speaker, the invited speaker of this session, so Kartek Bhagavan. Uh, so Kartek uh, graduated from IIT New Delhi, if I Sorry. saw this correctly, and then he did his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where he learned about programming languages, if I noticed this right. And then he went to industry uh, at some point to Microsoft Research in Cambridge and got interested into cryptography. So his research is uh, at the frontier between programming languages and uh, cryptography. He got uh, 2016 an award, in, so he's in France now, so I, I didn't mention that. So he moved to France probably as a good step uh, I mean, a good intuition view, uh, in view of what happens uh, nowadays uh, in UK. So he, he's happy to be in France with INRIA. And uh, since uh, 2009, I think, and uh, leading a, the project Prosecco at, at INRIA. He's heading this, this project. And got uh, 2016 an award of, uh, as a young scientist of INRIA and the Academy of sciences in France. So, please, Kartek. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so, uh, one, the very first conference I ever attended was FSTTC, so it gives me great joy to come back here. And I wish there were more students like what I was then uh, in the audience, but they'll still do. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about a little bit of the work we've been doing uh, in my group. And since it's Friday afternoon, and we've all heard a lot of talks, I'm going to focus more on problems than solutions. So I'll show you what are the kinds of things we're trying to solve. I'll tell you a little bit about how we're trying to solve them, but maybe you'll have better ideas on how to solve them yourself. So these are problems that are very much still open. All right, so what do I mean by real world cryptography? So we're all using this stuff, okay? So you use WhatsApp, I guess, you use Skype. Underneath Skype and WhatsApp, there's actually a protocol, well, if you use private conversations, which is going to give you end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. And this protocol is, well, for want of a better name, called the Signal Protocol. Okay, it's a very fancy protocol. It tries to protect your uh, conversations. Even if your device is stolen by somebody, they should not be able to read older messages. If they steal the device and give it back to you without you knowing it, they should not be able to re read future messages. So they give you lots of, uh, they try to achieve lots of uh, really fine-grained guarantees. Um, and they do this by using very novel construction. So it's a very new protocol, but it's already ubiquitous. So WhatsApp, Skype, everybody uses it. A second example, which again is kind of invisible to us, but is actually happening all over the place, is uh, machine learning, of course, right? And a lot of people are now concerned that machine learning algorithms are not privacy preserving, right? They don't really, uh, they just suck up huge amounts of data from all our devices and they're just putting into this black box. They don't even know what the black box does and out comes the result, but we don't know what they have learned about us. They may have learned things about us that even we didn't know about ourselves. So there's a new field which is getting growing a lot for called privacy preserving machine learning. And this involves a lot of cryptography. In fact, very modern kind of fancy cryptography. This is not working, so I'm gonna stand here. Uh, like secure multi-party computation. So just to give you an idea, so the model uh, owner, like Google, owns a model. They don't want to show you the model. You have the data. You don't want to give Google the data. And in between, there's some cloud server. You don't want to give the cloud server anything. So you all want to hide things from each other, but still do some fancy machine learning stuff. How do you do this? And there are, there are protocols to do this. But these are still, are, both the protocols I've shown you are kind of fairly new, evolving. These are open. People don't really know how to think about them. So let's switch back to a very classic old protocol that we've all been using now for 15, 20 years and it's a backbone of the web. This is a protocol called TLS, or Transport Layer Security. If you go to your bank or whatever on uh, Chrome you'll, or on Firefox, you'll see this little green thing or a, or a lock or whatever that will tell you that you have a, have a secure connection with your server, with your bank or Gmail or whatever. In that case, this secure channel is provided to you by TLS. And this is a 20, 25 year old protocol it should be like a very, very standard solved problem and there should be no problems left in this. Is that the case? Unfortunately not. So here's a selection, it's not a complete, it's a selection of attacks that came up on the TLS protocol uh, not too long ago, between 2011 and 2016. I haven't updated the slide, if I did it would go to another page if I continue uh, updating it for the last three years. So there's a ton of attacks, the ones in red are the ones my team found, so we are kind of very familiar with this literature on these attacks. So. This is a very well understood notion. I am going to my bank. I don't want my data to be revealed to the adversary. Um, and the adversary is anybody who is not me or my bank. You know, we should be able to solve this problem. It's a classic cryptographic problem. 
So what goes wrong with things like TLS? And this is not just TLS. Every cryptographic system that is successful has attacks on it. And what, what, why is it so hard to get these things right? Well, there's three layers of things that typically go wrong, okay? And it, for example, you might, uh, at the heart of your system is cryptography, right? And the cryptographic algorithm you're using or the cryptographic scheme or construction you're choosing may be weak. It may have some weakness in it that maybe cryptographers knew about but you didn't know about or maybe even they didn't know about and suddenly becomes uh, known and then suddenly the scheme uh, and the protocol collapse. That's case one. And this has happened for many protocols, uh, many algorithms at this point and there's a, a brief list up there. A second example is, well, okay, the crypto is all fine, but the way we put it together to make this protocol where the client is going to con communicate with the server, the server is going to do something and so on, that protocol might have a design flaw in it. This is actually rarer because people have been designing these, alg these protocols for 40 years now. So even before we had TLS, people have been designing these kinds of protocols. So we, you understand how to design them, but there are still flaws in them because they're hard to get right. The compositions of these things, very easy to get them wrong. And the third kind of problem is actually the most ubiquitous one, the stupidest one, shall we say, but actually the hardest to, to get rid of, which is implementation bugs. You have done amazing crypto, you have done a beautiful protocol, but then there's an implementation bug that allows you to bypass all the amazing crypto you did, and so now you're back to square zero or whatever. And often we have found in the, in the kinds of research you've done, is that the, the, the system breaks down due to a com combination of all three of these. So sometimes there's a little crypto weakness, a little protocol weakness, a little implementation bug, and they all come together in a perfect storm to completely break your protocol. And maybe we'll see an example or two of this kind of thing uh, in the talk. So what shall we do? Well, we should try to remove these kinds of problems, but before doing that, because we're not so familiar with these things, let's, let's actually take a look at some examples of, of, of what, I'm, what I'm talking about here. So, some example attacks, okay? So here's uh, the most simple core protocol that is taught in Crypto 101, which is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's at the heart of IPsec, SSH, TLS, Signal, whatever you think about. Every protocol, every cryptographic protocol uses this as, at its heart. The idea is that there is A, let's call it the client, there's B, let's call it the server. They're going to communicate with each other, and at the end of the communication, they're both going to have a shared key K, and this key K is known only to A and B, so that they can now use that to encrypt messages to each other without anybody else being able to see this. Okay? And so to do this in this protocol, A sends G to the power X modulo some large prime P. Uh, B sends G to the power Y modulo some large prime P. They both compute G to the power X, Y. And there is a nice assumption called the Diffie-Hellman assumption that tells us that this is, uh, the resulting key will be known only to A and B. I'm lying, of course, because in this case there is no authentication. So there's a well-known attack on this protocol that I showed you. It's called the man-in-the-middle attack on anonymous Diffie-Hellman, if you want a name for it. And the basic idea is the following. So A was sending the G to the X uh, to B, right? But there's a network attacker. There's somebody on the network who intercepts this message, changes X to X prime, and sends G to the X prime uh, to B. Similarly, when the message comes back, G to the Y, it changes G to the Y to G to the Y prime and sends it to A. And at the end of it, both A and B think, ah, oh, okay, we've connected, we've got our keys. But in fact, the attacker knows both the keys on both sides. So he's a, uh, what they call a man in the middle, a person in the middle, who has completely taken over or hijacked this connection. And that's because A did never had to prove that its own identity, never had to authenticate itself, and B never had to authenticate itself either. So this protocol was destined to be broken by a network attacker. An active network attacker would break this protocol. But there's a fix. Uh, there's a classic construction called Sigma, where Sig stands for signatures, Ma stands for Mac. So sigma, where you add a signature, a digital signature, and you add a, uh, a Mac, and you need to add both, actually. If you add only one of them, it actually, again, there are many other attacks that have appeared. So it took them a long time to, fi to figure this out. But finally, the cryptographers came to an agreement that what you needed to secure uh, a Diffie-Hellman-like protocols is something like this, where you have a way of authenticating both um, uh, A and B to each other. So they came up with this protocol. The details, not so important unless you're interested in cryptography. And the security of that protocol uh, basically uh, lies, uh, relies completely on this one assumption, the Diffie-Hellman uh, assumption. And let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So the key that you're going to be agreeing on is g to the power xy mod p, where x and y are two random numbers that have been generated between 0 and p. P is some large prime, let's say it's 2048-bit prime. Again, you know, generated as a large prime that has been generated. 
and everybody knows P, but uh, X is known only to A and Y is known only to B. So the Diffie-Hellman assumption, the hardness of the Diffie-Hellman problem, is basically the idea that if, you, uh, if the attacker does not know X and it does not know Y, then the attacker cannot compute G to the power X, Y mod P, just given uh, G to the X and G to the Y. So by looking at what's happening in the protocol, he cannot get the final key, okay? And there are various, many versions of this assumption uh, that are written in different ways, with different kinds of probabilistic uh, uh, assumptions made on them and so on. But this is more or less a high level idea. Now, if I say that uh, I've got a Diffie-Hellman assumption, I'm gonna use my protocol that uses Diffie-Hellman. Now you're gonna ask me next is, well, yeah, but uh, when, why is this problem hard? At what point does it become hard? And until what point is it easy? And in all things cryptography, you will find that uh, things that are hard today will be easy tomorrow because the attacker's capability grows as our own computational capability grows, okay? So there is never a fixed thing. So today you're encrypting something with 2048-bit Diffie-Hellman. It does not mean that that is going to remain secure forever. In 20 years from now, that 2048-bit prime might be very easy to break. So in particular, there are, there, is, there are a few groups around the world who are always going for the world record in breaking the discrete log problem, which is essentially breaking Diffie-Hellman. So in 2005, uh, there was a record which they broke a 430-bit prime, which means if you give them g to the x mod p, they could give you x. So could, they could compute the discrete log for a 430-bit p. And this number has grown consistently, okay? Now we know for certain that we can do 768-bit primes. It is, it is believed that the NSA can do 1,024-bit primes, but we don't know, but maybe they can. Maybe bigger, we don't know. All right, so that gives us a bound. So it says that don't use primes up to that uh, 1,024 bits, otherwise you're screwed, right? So let's say 2,048 seems safe. So that's why I put 2,048 on the previous slide. But we have to be aware that there is this weakness if you use a weak P, yeah? So how do protocols get around this? So there are some weak P's and there are some strong P's, right? And the way they get around this is by doing negotiation, right? So 20 years ago, when IPsec was first uh, started to be deployed, they used uh, primes which were 512 bit and 768 bits. TLS also had uh, a 512 bit prime for export use, which means everything but the US was allowed to use 512 bits, and people in the US were allowed to use 1024 bits, okay? So a lot of places you'll see these old, small, weak primes lying around for backwards compatibility or regulations or whatever. But normally we never want to use them because as, we, as, as I said, 512 bit is too weak, okay? So every protocol out there, SSH, IPsec, TLS, whatever you use, has a negotiation phase. In the beginning, Alice is going to say to, say to Bob, hey Bob, I support these two groups. One of them has 2,000 bits, one of them has 500 bits. Which one do you support? So Bob looks at it and says, yeah, I support 2048 bit group, so let me pick the good one. I'll pick the best one, and we will both work on the best common group that we have between each other. This is a bit simplistic because there could be many different groups with 2000 bits, so it might say, I support these three 2000 bit groups, you support those two, okay, let's pick one that we both support, and we'll continue. And this is called negotiation. All protocols need to have this, otherwise you will never be able to communicate between a Microsoft device and, a, and an Apple device, for example, because they support different things, they have to find something in common. Okay, and in this case, nobody really wants them to ever choose the 512-bit one, and they will not normally, because now if you take Google Chrome and you connect to Gmail, they both will support the strongest one, they will choose the strongest one, and they're done. So normally, this means that everything should be safe, right? Except not, because there is a man-in-the-middle attack, remember the one on anonymous Diffie Hellman, the same kind, which works on that kind of a negotiation protocol, it's called a downgrade attack, and the idea is, the idea is the following. So there is a network attacker as before, who's looking for messages that you're sending to your bank. So your browser sends to the bank and says, I support these two groups, a strong group and a weak group. The attacker deletes the weak group, and just, uh, sorry, deletes the strong group, and just lets the weak group go through. So the server looks at this and says, oh, well, this must be a really old client, maybe a printer or something. Uh, okay, I don't care. If he wants a weak group, I'll give him the weak group. So he, the server says, okay, let's do the weak group. Now on the way back, the attacker just lets the weak group go back to the client, and client looks at it and says, oh, this must be a really old server, maybe a printer or something, and I don't care, so okay, if he wants to do a weak group, he'll do a weak group. And they both downgrade themselves to the weakest group because the attacker tampered with the message, and they continue with the whole protocol. The whole protocol is done with 512-bit uh, security, which the attacker knows how to break, 
Okay? That was the basic idea behind this attack called the logjam attack that I and many, other, many of our colleagues found in 2015. For that, we had to use a specific crypto attack on 512-bit groups, for which we did a lot of crypto analysis with a group in, uh, in, uh, in Loria, in France. Then we had to figure out how to get the protocol to downgrade, which we did in Indria. Then we kind of found all kinds of groups around the world that people were using and showed that a huge number of these groups were vulnerable to this, which was done in the US. And so this, uh, this, this attack was actually practical against uh, a significant chunk of the internet. You could break uh, the connections to them by using this attack. And that's not the only one. These kinds of downgrade attacks where you support something strong and you support something weak for legacy backwards compatibility reasons happen all the time. So there are like four examples up there. Uh, you can uh, get, the, the attacker can basically force you to use the weakest possible option that you have, okay? And this basically makes it very uh, problematic to fix these attacks. So if you uh, upgrade your software, the, any, up, any software that you upgrade, so you had an old version and now you're getting a new version. The new version is never going to delete the old version. It's going to put the new version in addition to the old one. So now you always have this downgrade possibility that the attacker can force you to use the old version when you did not want to use the old version. So the only fix really for protocols like TLS and for other protocols like this is to really get rid of everything old. Make sure that anything which is known to be broken does not exist in the software anymore. Okay? This is notoriously hard because things hide somewhere in the software. You think they're gone, but they're not gone. OpenSSL is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines long. Chrome is a million lines long. You can't be sure that MD5 has been removed from everywhere. And probably it's, it is there somewhere because someone does have an old printer that they do want to connect to and they can't get rid of it. And the worst part of it is that even if you uh, manage to get rid of all these uh, crypto problems and fix, fix all your downgrade issues, you may still have implementation bugs. So let's take a look at that. So in TLS 1.2, there were two kinds of handshakes that everybody was using. A handshake is like a protocol for setting up the key, like the one we saw for Diffie-Hellman, right? So one of them was not a Diffie-Hellman one, it's called RSA. The details are not so important, but it basically had four messages, and at the end of it, you had a key, okay? And the flow of messages was something like the one I'm showing on the right. So there was a client hello, server hello, server certificate, server hello, blah, 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 okay? This sequence of messages going between the client and the server, at the end of it, both of them have a good key. It also supported a Diffie-Hellman mode, like the one I showed you, which also had the, a similar flow of things, which has slightly different cryptographic constructions, but at the end of it, again, you have a good key. The, if you just look at the messages that were on the wire, there was only one difference between those two, which is the one which is circled in green, which is that in the Diffie-Hellman mode, there was one extra message, okay, which was a G to the Y that the server had to send back to the client. There's one extra message called the server key exchange. Otherwise, all the messages more or less were the same which means that if you wanted to write an implementation of this, and you wanted to write parsers for each message and the state machine for each message and what to do when you get this message or that message or what error to send and so on, which is all this code that you have to write in protocols, you really want to share all the code as much as possible between those two modes, except for that one message which is extra here, right? So you want to compose the state machines, that let's think of them as state machines, right? These two state machines for these two protocols, and you want to compose them in a way that you share as much as you, as you can. So this is what I would say is the composite state machine for those two. The one in the middle, the one on the left is RSA, the one in the middle is Diffie-Hellman, and one on the right is a composite state machine. It has one branch. So after the server certificate message, if you are in Diffie-Hellman mode, you go straight down and you do the server key exchange. If you're in RSA mode, you switch out, you skip the next message, and you go to the, to the next message in the protocol. Now, this is just looking at the message flow, yeah? Inside the messages, there is very different data going on here, and we still have to do some interesting crypto and so on. But just looking at the overall message flow, what the state machine looks like. And this is for just the two modes that we have looked here. In reality, TLS actually has many other modes. It has this thing called resumption, it has some other kinds of uh, PSK modes and so on. So if you take all the modes that are commonly used on the web, the state machine looks a little bit like that on the right. So. It's a bit more complex, a few more branches, but still, you know, more or less, you know, something that you could code up in almost any of the verification tools I can think of. So that's, I would say, the state machine for TLS as it's used on the web, right? So it covers most of the features. But the state machine I've shown you there is actually something I've invented. It's actually not in the spec. Nobody really agrees on what the state machine should be. It's something we, you can infer by reading the spec. So it's a good question to ask, is this what real implementations do? I mean, this is my guess of what they should do but is this what they do? 
So you can take that as a spec and test existing implementations, or in this case, fuzz existing implementations to see if they follow that uh, state machine. And we found when we did this exercise in 2015, 2016, that a lot of implementations of this protocol, even in your browsers and mainstream servers, mainstream browsers, did not follow the nice uh, state machine structure I had before. In the, on the right is OpenSSL, one of the most important implementations of TLS, which is used on almost all web servers, websites everywhere. And it had these extra edges in the state machine. An extra edge is when I expect you to uh, not accept this message, but you're accepting this message. Or I expect you to accept this message, but for some reason you're not accepting this message. That would be a, a one less edge. So the worry, worrisome case is always the extra edges. Are you accepting something you should not accept? So the ones in uh, green are the extra edges that are accepted by the server. The ones in red are the extra edges that are accepted by the client. Okay. Uh, in the OpenSSL. Then if you go look in Java, because Java has a, a TLS implementation, so if you ever do a HTTP connection from your Java program to PayPal or eBay or Amazon or whatever, which a lot of people do, because this is what Java APIs are for, uh, then you'll be using the Java TLS uh, stack. And the Java TLS stack has a ton more extra one. Pretty much you can go from any state to any state. Okay? So it's not a state machine anymore, it's just a fully connected graph. So they have done this pretty bad implementation, let's say, where they just allow you to send any message after any message. And the hope is, their hope is that, well, it doesn't matter at the end of the protocol, if we screwed up, then the keys will be different, and so nothing bad is going to happen. And while the protocol is going on, let's just take any sequence of messages, we'll try to process it the best we can. If something goes wrong, we'll throw an error. You know, it's not a big deal. So this actually can be traced back to this notion that came up in the early days of the internet, where uh, I think it's called Postal's Principle, which, is, which says, be strict in what you send, but be liberal in what you accept. And this was at the heart of the interoperability that drew, drove the internet, which meant that if Microsoft was doing something crazy with their stack, or Cisco was doing something crazy with their stack, they would still try to accept some weirdness from the other side, because they don't know what exactly you're doing. So you have one extra bit, okay, I'm, I'll try to figure it out, what you're doing, okay? So they would be willing to accept more crazy stuff from the other guy, but when they were sending, they would be trying to send uh, straight up stuff. So that could be one reason why these guys are willing to accept so many extra edges, which should not be accepted. But here's the question, is this actually a bug, or is it just a you know, badly designed thing, or maybe my spec was wrong? Well, of course it's a bug, and it's a bug which is exploitable. So uh, say you're using uh, PayPal's Java, Java SDK, which a lot of merchants use online, yeah? So if you click on Pay with PayPal or something like that, then it's going to use this Java SDK to do this payment with PayPal. So the Java SDK, uh, your merchant side is connecting to PayPal, right? Your attacker is in the middle. He wants to intercept this message by pretending to be PayPal. Of course, he's not PayPal, so he doesn't know PayPal certificate. So the first thing he does is uh, when the uh, client sends a hello, he stops the message and he sends back PayPal certificate. PayPal certificate, everybody knows. He can do this, no problem. The next message after that is this thing called the server key exchange message where he's supposed to actually sign uh, with PayPal's private key. But he doesn't know PayPal's private key, so he can't do this. So what's he gonna do? But the Java state machine allows him to skip messages, so he's gonna just skip this message, right? So let's see, then he's supposed to send this message called a server hello done, but if he does this, then the client is gonna start sending more messages and he doesn't know how to process them, so he's gonna skip the next message. But once you skip the next message, the client is still waiting, which means you've effectively skipped the next four messages. And now you're in the next message that the server is supposed to send called the CCS. But if you send the server CCS message, it means that everything from now on will have to be encrypted. But we don't have an encryption key. We have done nothing. We didn't do any crypto whatsoever. So there is no key. We have not done nothing so far. We just skipped everything. So what are we going to do now? So what this guy does is he says, well, let me try the same trick. He's going to skip that message too. Now there is this last message, which is the finished message, which means that the protocol is finished. If you don't send that message, everybody is just waiting. The, nothing has happened. Everybody is just hanging in the, uh, on the phone, right? So you have to send that last message. But the last message requires you to send a MAC, and the MAC requires a key, and the key was the key we were supposed to have agreed in this protocol, but we have done nothing in this protocol. We haven't agreed on a key. But Java has this nice feature that Java is a type-safe language, which means that, of course, it has a slot for the key, and of course, the slot for the key is initialized to all zeros, so maybe you can use all zeros as the key and try to send this message. And if you do, it will accept it. And at this point, we have bypassed the whole protocol. 
In fact, we, we didn't even turn on encryption, so the client will start sending messages in the clear to PayPal, thinking it's fully connected to PayPal, but in fact, it never even touched PayPal, okay? What's, what's worse here is that, at this point, uh, if you try to, if the client tries to ask Java, hey, Java, tell me what, is, what kind of connection do you have? It'll say, oh, don't worry, we have 5,000-bit security, uh, we have, here's PayPal certificate, which has this 4,000-bit certificate. Everything is like the best quality crypto that you can see. But actually, all the crypto was bypassed because of the state machine bugs. So this is a particularly bad case, okay, where the protocol, the implementation bug in the protocol, which is a state machine bug, allowed you to completely bypass the full protocol, completely, right? But there are many other cases which are more subtle than this, where you bypass one message, then you have to do some crypto trick, then you bypass another message and so on. So even if you find a tiny little one bug somewhere in an implementation, you should never assume that, oh, this can't really be exploited, this will lead to an error, because you don't know. There could be some combination of things that will allow you to break this. So the summary of that stupid attack on the previous slide was that if you were using Java to do anything secure before 2015, you shouldn't have bothered. You were, you were pretty much completely at the mercy of the attacker. And this, was, uh, this is true between 1997 and 2005. For 16 years, uh, whatever, some, something around that, uh, there was this bug which nobody noticed. So let's come back. So we saw crypto weaknesses for, the, uh, for logjam. We saw protocol flaws like downgrade attacks. We saw implementation bugs like that uh, silly thing in Java. So this is like a, just a sample. So how do we be sure that the WhatsApp thing that I'm using on my phone or the TLS thing I'm using to interact with my bank is actually correct, is, it, is actually secure? So this is where we argue that you can't do this. It's too complicated. You can't do this just by staring at the documents. You need formal verification. So formal verb methods are the only method I know for getting any kind of confidence in complex systems like these. And this is a very good and impactful area for you to apply your techniques as well if you have some new techniques that you want to try out. Because clearly, if you break something here, it breaks the security of something important. So it, uh, the impact is usually pretty straightforward. So in particular, in my group, we've been looking at doing symbolic analysis, and I'll show you an example to find attacks. We do cryptographic proofs of security using tools like CryptoVerif and FSTAR. We also develop crypto protocol software, verified software using uh, FSTAR. But there are other groups who are using other tools like Coq, Cryptol, VST, Tamarin, and VCrypt, and so on. And all of these tools are coming to a level of maturity that many of you should be able to use them uh, to do effective things. So let's take an example of what we can do with these kinds of tools. Um, so the first one is going to be how do we verify something like TLS that it doesn't have some of the kind of downgrade attacks that we saw before, right? In particular, let's look at TLS 1.3. So um, last year, 2018, uh, the new version of TLS 1.3 was released to big fanfare, actually. There's a lot of news articles and so on. And that is because it took about four years of effort to standardize this new protocol. 28 drafts, 12 meetings, lots and lots of people were involved. And primarily, this, it took much longer than they expected because as they were developing this protocol, more and more of the kinds of attacks that I showed you before started appearing in the old version of the protocol. And then they realized that they had to throw away completely TLS 1.2 and start from scratch if they have to avoid these protocols, uh, these bugs in the future. But what's more, this time they did an experiment. They invited academic security researchers, including us, but anybody who was interested, to come and help them analyze the protocol as it was being developed. The protocol, its implementations, its cryptography, and so on. So even before the, the standard was finally published, there were like 10 to 12 papers in major conferences analyzing the protocol, saying this is good, this is not good, and so on. So this really was a very symbiotic relationship between the researchers and, and the standardization body. And I was involved in, in some of this work as well. So what is new with this protocol? Well, the first thing they did, and good thing they did, is to throw away all the bad crypto. Right? So they killed all the bad crypto, uh, and they added new downgrade protection mechanisms, which were actually be designed to, to make the protocol stronger. So that was a good thing they did. The bad thing they did is they tried to make it faster. So, uh, so they added this new mode called Zero RTT, which really allows you to do connections really very fast, and it's a bit dodgy. It's not really uh, something I would recommend people use. Um, but they have a new mode called One RTT, which is already faster than the previous protocol, and it's actually very good, and that's, that's the mode that I would recommend everybody use. The third thing they did was they completely changed the way TLS works with its applications so that the composition of various modes of TLS and of TLS and its applications becomes cleaner. And this, we don't know whether it will actually have an impact in the future. We have to see 
as new applications comes up, whether or not this is going to make a big difference. But all of this put together meant that this is a completely new protocol which looks nothing like what the previous protocol looked like. So if you want to write the whole protocol out, and if I was writing uh, in my papers, this is kind of what the uh, protocol would look like. It's too big, I'm not, I'm not going to explain this here. Uh, but it's basically, this is the one RTT handshake, which is the main uh, key exchange uh, kind of component. It has 12 messages and three flights and 16 derived keys, and then you can do uh, uh, messages, messaging, okay? So you have to like derive 16 keys before you can start sending messages. And in addition to this, of course, you also have another other modes which are faster, but one important thing to remember is that TLS 1.3 was released last year, right? TLS 1.2 was released in 2008. So this took 10 years for the next version to come out. And TLS 1.2 only became ubiquitous in the last three or four years. So it takes a long time for new versions to completely dominate the landscape. So we expect that in another five years, TLS 1.3 will be everywhere. But until those five years are done, you're gonna have TLS 1.2 and 1.3 running side by side, okay? So now we have to worry about this because you have an old version and a new version, which means possibly downgrade. So we have to think whether or not there could be downgrade attacks from 1.3 to 1.2. So let's ask this question. I showed you, I flashed you a protocol in the previous slide. Now, is this protocol provably secure? I mean, for 1.2, I told you it is not provably secure. There are lots and lots of attacks. 1.3, is it provably secure? We can ask this question and we can try to formalize this. So remember, this was what we started off with. This is my connection to my bank. I have some very standard security goals. I want a secure channel. I want there to be confidentiality on my password, which I type, and my bank account details. And I want authentication. This, the, I, know, I need to know that I'm talking to my bank. My bank needs to know that it's talking to me. So we want mutual authentication between, each, between ourselves. Okay, but this is a classic secure channel. So how do we formalize it? So uh, this is an, this is not obviously the formal statement, which will take several pages, but this is roughly what uh, every formal statement of the secure channel would say. So first you have a model of the protocol. So in this case, we are saying that the client and the server A and B are both, a TL one is a TLS client, one is a TLS server. You'll see what that means. We want them to be honest. So let's assume that we are talking about only an honest client and honest server, which means that their own key material is secret. The attacker does not know their key material. But the attacker, and then we have to define a threat model, is in full control of the network. So anything that goes on the network, the attacker can read, write, modify, whatever. Okay. Furthermore, the attacker is in control of all other clients and all other servers. So let's just focus on these two guys who we want to protect. Assume that everybody else in the world is corrupt. Okay, all the other clients and servers. Then the security goal is that if A sends a message M to B, the attacker should still not able to uh, learn this message M. Okay, so if the whole world was using a crappy version of TLS, but you and I are using a good version of TLS that is probably secure, then it must be the case that our messages are still secure between us. So that's like the definition of a secure channel. Now, in order to make this more precise, we have to say what is our execution model? What is A running? What is B? What is the, what is the definition of the attacker? And there are several different ways of defining this, broadly classifiable into two classes. There's a symbolic methods and there are the computational methods. In the symbolic methods, we say that A is a high-level program that uses, uh, that basically manipulates terms and sends terms out on the network. Where a term is a symbolic term called dollar Yao term or a Needham Schroeder term, which uh, abstracts around cryptography. So, uh, so an encryption is a constructor, a decryption is a destructor. Whereas the computational model, which is what the cryptographers use, says that the uh, A and B are actually probabilistic polynomial Turing machines. And what they're doing is all their computations are over bit strings. So the things that you're communi communicating are bit strings, the things they're computing are bit strings. Converse, similarly, if you're you modeling the attacker in the symbolic model, it's another high-level program, which is also at the same level as A and B, and is able, has the same computational power as A and B, whereas in the uh, computational model, it's also a PPT uh, machine. It's also allowed to only do manipulations on bit strings, and it's not, there are some very strong ways in which we limit what it can do with cryptography. So in the, in the, among the security goals, if I'm trying to say that M is secret, in the symbolic model, I say that in all traces of the model, uh, M cannot be obtained by the adversary. In the computational model, I try to say that even a single bit of M will not be revealed to the adversary up to some probability P. So in the computational model, all the statements are probabilistic. In the symbolic model, they usually are possibilistic or uh, trace-based, 
So for TLS 1.3, what does this mean? It means that what you're going to do is you're going to write down concrete models as high-level programs, let's say in the symbolic model or in the computational model of the client and the server. And there are many different ways you can do this. And here's just a sample. We are going to use the Applied Pi Calculus, which is a source language for this verification tool called ProVerif. But you can use any of these other languages as well, if you're depending on what kind of analysis you want to do. Then you're going to write down your threats by modeling the precise cryptographic assumptions of what the attacker can do and what he cannot do. Okay, again, this is simpler in the symbolic model and the computational model. There are very well-known ways of writing these as probabilistic equivalences, and you can do that too, and we have done that as well. And finally, you're going to write your security goals. Okay, so let's, let's do this exercise. This is what TLS 1.3 server looks like in ProVerif. It's the applied Pi calculus. So there are inputs, there are outputs. You can generate fresh keys. You can call cryptographic functions, and you can trigger security events, okay? The details of this code is not so important. These slides will be online, so you can stare at them later, or you can actually stare at the full model, which should be much more informative. And so in this case, this is applied pack calculus, which is verifiable using ProVerif. If you take the full model, including TLS 1.3, 1.2, and 1.2, the full protocol you can model in about 500 lines of applied pi. So it's not a very big model, actually. It's one of the larger models you will write in these tools, but it's not so huge. Then you have to write your assumptions about the crypto, and that'll take you about 400 lines. If you are doing a computational proof, this part, the writing the assumption, is the most hard part. So that'll take you maybe thousands of lines. But you can still do it. Right? It's still analyzable. And finally, you'll write your security goals in about a couple of hundred lines. So in a thousand lines or something, you have your full model of TLS, and you can press the button on ProVerif and ask, is this secure or not? And ProVerif will give you some answers. So before uh, going into how, to, how we call ProVerif, here's, I mean, Remember, recall that we have to define a threat model. In ProVerif, this is the threat model we'll have. The attacker is a fully powerful network adversary who can do anything on the network. And we're going to add this fact that the attacker is able to exploit downgrade attacks, which means that we're going to have not just strong cryptographic algorithms, but also weak cryptographic algorithms, where the weak ones the attacker can break, but the strong ones he cannot break. Okay? Normally, symbolic dollar view models don't do this, but you need this if you want to truly uh, look for downgrade attacks like the ones, like the log jam attack we talked about before. So we, we have this new kind of model, and now we can start analyzing stuff. So what kind of goals can we ask from, from ProVerif? We can say, can you prove that M is secret? Okay. Can you prove that M is authentic? Can you prove that it's forward secret, which means that even if my keys are compromised later, M will still be secret, and so on. So the, here's the simplest one. This basically is asking whether this message, which is sent on a particular connection to a particular server, is, um, will ever be known to the attacker. So this is a, called a security query in, uh, in ProVerif. You can ask this about a TLS 1.3 model, and ProVerif will immediately come back and say, oh yes, uh, there is an attack. Uh, the attacker can get this message if uh, the server's private key is compromised. But you say, yeah, yeah, but you know, I'm only considering honest servers. So let's assume that the server's private key is no, cannot be compromised, and let's ask a second query. ProVerif will come back again and say, oh no, this can still be broken if the authenticated encryption algorithm you used is weak. They say, okay, but I'm using TLS 1.3. There are no weak AE algorithms anymore, so let's uh, cut that out. And then it'll find the next problem, the next problem, and so on. The next problem after this it finds is that the Diffie-Hellman algorithm might be weak. And this, in fact, is a logjam attack. Okay? It's, and this you can't eliminate so easily because TLS 1.2 does use weak Diffie-Hellman algorithms. So if you have a TLS 1.3 server, that also supports TLS 1.2, and that TLS 1.2 part of it supports a weak Diffie-Hellman group, then you can do two hops of downgrades to get down to the bad Diffie-Hellman group, and then you can break the connection. So this is actually a real attack, and so on. And the final, the strongest query to which ProVerif will answer true is this one. And if you look at this carefully, it basically is listing all the conditions under which your connection is secure, or put another way, all the conditions you must satisfy before TLS 1.3 becomes secure. It says, for example, if you read it out, is that messages on a TLS 1.3 connection are honest, and this is a security theorem it's proving for us in the symbolic model, but it's proving a theorem here. If the, as long as the connection does not use bad algorithms, and as long as it does not use weak Diffie-Hellman uh, groups in any protocol, okay? And that's kind of, uh, some of these assumptions were not obvious to the designers of TLS 1.3 uh, either, but this has now become an advisory for how you should deploy TLS 1.3. And I would argue that this kind of problem where you're finding attacks on the combination of TLS 1.3 and 1.2, where each of them has five modes each, and each, of, each protocol is like 15 messages, is impossible to do by hand. You definitely need uh, formal tools to do this. 
And you will never be sure that you have found all the attacks unless you actually have a formal verification tool that can actually give you a positive result at the end of the things. So that was one uh, piece of the puzzle. There are other people who did crypto proofs, some people who did proofs by hand, some people who used tools to do this, but there was a whole bunch of proofs that came up for TLS 1.3, which is what gave us enough confidence to say maybe this is ready for publication. It doesn't mean that the protocol doesn't have bugs. It just means that we have bashed at it as much as we can with the tools at our disposal, and new attacks that will come out hopefully will uncover new problems, not old problems. So now I'm going to change tracks a little bit. So, so far we've been talking about protocols, TLS, blah, 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 attacks, uh, downgrade, fixing this and stuff. But like I said, all of these things are in the end going to be uh, dwarfed by the kinds of problems you can have when you implement them. We already saw the state machine bugs that come up when you try to implement the protocol, but let's assume that was just a stupid bug. Everybody knows how to implement a state, ma state machine. You know how to do it. You will do it correctly. Maybe you can verify that your state machine is correct. And in fact, we do these kinds of things as well. But the hardest part of any crypto library, of any protocol library, is actually the crypto layer. Because the cryptography that you're going to use actually is fairly fancy mathematics. And that, that fancy mathematics is hard to implement correctly. Okay. So what you want is also a verified crypto library. You can't trust that the algorithm that you're using, whether it's RSA or Diffie-Hellman or whatever, has been implemented correctly. There are tons of bugs. If you go to any crypto library, people are like constantly finding bugs in this thing. So uh, this is a different project I'm going to speak about, which is taking most of our time right now, which is we are building this verified crypto library called Hacklestar. We've already released one version. A second version is going to be released next month. And let's try to see what the problem is. What is, the, what is the problem we're trying to address here? Okay. So how do people write crypto code? The first thing you start off from is some kind of standard. So the NIST in America or the IETF, which is international, or somebody else, publishes a standard. So this is a standard called cha 20 poly 1305. It's fairly recent, 2015. Um, it's a encryption algorithm and a Mac algorithm. cha 20 is encryption, uh, poly 1305 is Mac. And put together, they give you a nice construction called AEAD which everybody wants to use. So this is one of the more popular new encryption algorithms that has come up. So if you look in the core, if you look inside the standard, you will find some pseudocode. So have, there is some pseudocode there says, this is what you should do. This is the block encryption function. This is, it's kind of almost looks like Python, but it's not quite. It's, uh, it's kind of semi-formal pseudocode, which tells you what the code should be doing. And then you are supposed to take that and you're supposed to implement it and typically in C. Some people implement it directly in assembly uh, and so on. And if you look at the C code, it looks more or less like what the pseudocode looked like. So you can argue that there is not much that can go wrong between the, the spec and the code, except maybe, okay, you are, now you're doing some memory allocation. So you could have a memory bug for sure. Um, you also, uh, the algorithm that is specified in the spec only says, oh, here's how you do encryption of one big block. But in reality, you never do encryption of a big block. You do it like chunk by chunk by chunk. So you have to figure out how to do that chunk by chunk encryption. The standard will not help you with that. So there are some more things that could go wrong because you did this wrong. Okay, but on the whole, there's not very deep things that can go wrong here. Okay, so let's accept that. Okay, so we could have introduced a buffer overflow or there could be a timing leak. We'll talk a bit more about timing leaks later. Let's look at the other algorithm there. It's poly1305, uh, which is a Mac algorithm. Actually, that's the full spec of that Mac algorithm. It's very, very tiny. You can describe the whole algorithm in about, what, 15 lines of Python. Okay, it's very, very tiny. Okay, and this is what is usually used if you're using your phone on Chrome on phone to connect to Gmail, they're using this algorithm. And if you look deep inside that algorithm, there is two lines there where it says A equals A plus N. And it says A equals R times A modulo P. This P that they are speaking about is actually a 130-bit prime. There are other standards like this where it will be a 255-bit prime. There are some others where it's a 521-bit prime. There are specific primes. So this is a 130-bit prime. So the moment you look at that, you realize that when you're doing this addition and you're doing this multiplication and this modulo operation, you are not working on 32-bit numbers. Okay? You're not working on numbers that are available in your programming language. 130-bit numbers doesn't exist in our, any of our programming languages we use right now. So this is actually a big num computation. It's a, it's a computation on a number which is larger than what your platform pro provides you. So how are you going to implement just those two lines? That Those two lines account for most of the complexity of the implementation of poly. 
So, if you look at it, it basically breaks it down. It says, okay, 130 bit number, I'm going to represent it as five 32 bit numbers. Well, actually, you only needed four and a bit, but you have to use five, so which makes, uh, I don't know, it, it makes enough that you can use, uh, put 130 bits in it. And now, when you do addition, you have to addition, you have to add the, it's like two arrays, like a big number addition of two arrays of five uh, 32 bit numbers, you're going to add them. And you're going to propagate carries, you're going to do all kinds of management, and so on. So, there's a lot more code. It's a very much larger implementation than Cha Cha 20. And they, they can have lots and lots of bugs. And people have found carry propagation bugs, arithmetic bugs, buffer overflows, timing leaks, all kinds of problems in this code, which was not there in the other code. So this is the kind of place where you can very easily find uh, problems in your, in your crypto software. And to see why, let's go back, not just to crypto 101, but class two or class one or whatever, when we first learned how to do multiplication. Right, this is textbook multiplication of bits. So this is how we do it. We all do it for digits, but okay, for bits. And remember, you have to do this carry, and you have to do this add, and the add might have another carry, and so on. There's actually two carry bits that you have to carry around when you do this kind of multiplication. And yeah, you don't need to know the details. But in fact, it turns out that you have to go back to class two when you do this kind of coding, because that's exactly the kind of computation you are doing when you're multiplying 130-bit numbers or 256-bit numbers. So if you're multiplying 256 bit numbers, it's going to look something like this. You're going to break it up into 64, 64, 64, 64. So there are four, four bits, let's say, four digits. And then you're going to multiply them. You're going to have to carry along, and you're going to have to carry down, and you're going to add everything, and so on. The only special thing is this is modular multiplication. So at the end, you're going to take your seven limb or eight limb number, and you're going to have to reduce it back modulo p to come back to a, a four limb number. Okay, and there are many algorithms for doing this, and more and more fancy optimizations for doing this. Some uh, instruction sets give you special instructions that help optimize some steps of this because it's so common that you would want to do this for any big num computation, whether it's in numerical computations or crypto. All right, and this multiplication right here is a dominant cost of cryptography on all your devices. Just multiplication, and typically multiplication of 256-bit numbers. It used to be multiplication of 2,000 bit numbers, which is more serious, but with elliptic curves, now typically it's 256 bit numbers that you're multiplying, and that's the dominant cost of crypto for all the protocols that you use. Okay, because here you're doing n square 64 times 64 multiplications, and that's kind of costly. If you do karat suba, you can do a little bit less and so on, whatever, but it's, uh, it's more like this. But let's worry more about the correctness of these things. Now you're gonna have these long intermediate arrays. Every number is an array. So now you have to allocate these arrays, deallocate these arrays, make sure you copy them correctly. Um, and you have many, many carry steps that you have to do all over the place to make sure that the numbers you're computing are correct. Right, so what can go wrong? You could have integer overflow, which is very common, which in some places will give you a trap, uh, and in other places is okay, but it'll just give you the wrong result. You could have buffer overflow and underflow, of course. You could have missing carry steps, which is surprisingly a common uh, bug that people do in this, typically when they're optimizing their code or you could have a side channel attack. So let's look at what a side channel attack in this case would be. Going back to the simple multiplication there. So when you're multiplying like this, uh, 10, 110, 100, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, you might observe that when you see a zero bit, you really have to do nothing. There's nothing going to be added because you can just shift and you can move on. You can just ignore the steps where there is zero because there's really nothing happening. And if you do that, you cut down the, sp uh, the computations you have to do by half, which is nice. Uh, so it's much faster, fewer additions, fewer carries. The negative is that if somebody is looking at how much time it took you to do that multiplication, they now know how many zeros are there in the second argument. And since the second argument is often a key, a secret key, knowing how many zeros are there will allow them to mount an attack that will soon reveal your entire private key. So that is a timing side channel, where the time taken by a computation is revealing things about your arguments and that revelation is enough to break the cryptographic uh, algorithm that you're going to do, okay? So uh, almost all the crypto code you are going to ever want to write is going to be constant time in the sense that you never want the, the running time of the algorithm to depend on any secret input. So that's a very important criterion. So okay, so we talked about buffer overflows, all these kinds of carry bugs and so on. Let's start, how do we verify this code? So the idea here that we're using is that, well, don't just go straight from the, from the standard. Let's write a formal spec, which is halfway between the standard and the code, okay? And then we will prove that the code that we are generating is uh, correct with respect to the spec. So it's functionally correct, it's memory safe, and it has no timing side channels. That's what you want to prove. 
And that's what we do with, uh, with this language called F star. And we have built this library called Hackle star, which I'm, that paper's about it and stuff like that, and this talk is not long enough for that, but you can uh, go look at it and ask me any questions you like. It already uh, supports a wide range of algorithms, and, uh, uh, and we're growing this, and in which we prove memory safety, secret independence, and functional correctness. Uh, and the code that we generate from it is C code, which is fairly portable. We can also generate WebAssembly code. And this code is currently used in Firefox, in uh, the WireGuard VPN, which is in the Linux kernel, and in the Tezos blockchain and the Concordium blockchains. So it's already kind of fairly widely used. So what makes this, uh, as a formal methods uh, project, which is actually verifying code, what makes this actually take that last step towards impact? It's performance. So when we tried to get our code into Google, into Firefox and stuff, the first question they asked was, how much slower is your code than the code that I already have? My code may not be correct, but it's fast. But your code is correct, but it's slow. I'll probably stay with my, correct, my incorrect but fast code. And they gave us numbers, like you can't be more than 5% slower. Because for Google, 5% translates to millions of dollars on their data centers, okay? So that if you take 5% uh, slow down. Unless they are so sure that their old code is buggy, they will not change. But what's, what's nice is that if you're doing your verification technology in the right way and you're generating code which is say in C, which is also verified, then you can cross this uh, gap. So the code that we generated for Firefox was 20% faster than their previous unverified C code. So it was a no-brainer for them to accept it. And now we have jumped that by two times or three times even. So we are much faster than what they ever used to have. And in fact, if you want to go all the way to really hand-coded assembly code that people write to get maximum performance out of these algorithms, you can even do that. So there is a project called Veil, vale, where they verify assembly code for arithmetic programs like the ones we're writing here. And you can compose verified code from Hackle and verified code from Veil vale to get essentially the fastest uh, crypto implementations that have ever been seen. And that's in our paper called Evercrypt, which will come, up, come out in, uh, in Oakland this coming year. So uh, the end result of this is that if you go to, if you open up Firefox, you go to Google and you go to the console, you'll see there it's using X25519 and that's our code. And uh, not just that, there's another five algorithms that they have taken from us. And so all connections between you and Google is going, uh, is using verified crypto uh, done by us. It's not just us though, there's a group in MIT which, who have this project called Fiat Crypto and they have delivered code to Chrome. So even in Chrome, there is one component of it which is using uh, software, verified software uh, of this kind. Okay, stepping back, just as kind of quick uh, summary, I've told you about verified crypto, verified protocols, but there's of course tons of interesting problems here. We are working on verified messaging and there are many other groups working on this as well, which is like WhatsApp, but also group messaging. There are lots of open challenges there. We have also been working on verifying privacy preserving machine learning algorithms with Prasad. And this is, uh, again, a huge area, increasingly important area that we need more people to, to pay attention to and, and work on. And all of this is under these two projects that I, I, I participate in. One is called Circus and one is called Everest. And I welcome you to go look at their web pages and see all the various kinds of things that people have been doing around verified software and verified crypto in these projects. Okay, conclusion. Uh, I hope I have given you a little bit of a flavor to convince you that formal methods uh, are at this, have reached the stage where we can be effective on real world crypto protocols, but also have a real significant impact. So it's an exciting time to be because all these tools have come to maturity. We know how we can really have an impact, but there's still lots of nice, important and uh, open problems left. Like we don't know how to do zero knowledge proofs, we don't know how to do uh, group messaging and so on. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, on the software verification side, we have, I think, at this point in our development as a field, crossed the bridge where we no longer have to sacrifice performance for correctness. We can make high performance, in fact, higher performance than existing code, uh, which is verified, at least in this domain. So it's, uh, again, uh, a domain that I would encourage you to look at. Again, many, many challenges. Everybody who's ever doing any blockchain-related research is very ex wants verified code here, and they don't have enough. Uh, people doing machine learning, of course, and then there is this whole new field of post-quantum crypto, which is untouched. So there's like nice open areas where you can do lots of interesting work. All right, so I'm gonna conclude with this last slide, which is to say that we are hiring, and we're always hiring. We're looking for excellent students and PhD students and postdocs, so, uh, uh, and visiting researchers. So if you're interested in any of the topics related to anything that I've spoken of today, do get in touch. Thank you.
Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So we have now some time for questions. What about, I mean, protocols like WhatsApp where you have uh, multiple participants in, in the protocol, so where you have uh, possibly multiple attackers. So how do these, uh, these tools and these formalizations work with multiple attackers? Uh, we just submitted a paper on, on group messaging. Uh, so uh, there is this new uh, effort at the ITF called Messaging Layer Security. But what, uh, what the, the question pointed out was an important one, which is that we are all, uh, we kind of understand what point-to-point -point security is. But security for groups is a completely different beast because even stating the properties there is hard. And especially when you have WhatsApp groups, well, WhatsApp groups go to 256, but there are messaging groups that go to 10,000 people. So what are the security assumptions here? How do you kind of protect the uh, group against one malicious participant or maybe n by two malicious participants is a completely new set of challenges. So there are new protocols, that are including the one in WhatsApp, which uh, can be analyzed with methods similar to what I, what I said here, except that they very quickly grow to uh, very huge state spaces. So almost anything that is based on symbolic model checking or something finitary will immediately fail in these group settings. So you need something, uh, a verification method that can really handle um, uh, induction and recursion and so on uh, to do this. And F star is one such uh, method. Coq is another method which will allow you to analyze these things. But there are lots of interesting challenges. Here. Hi. So, sorry, I think part of it you covered in the last part of your answer. That is, in F star, you indicated the kind of functionality there of the, that your verification engine would have. I wanted to ask you about the underlying technologies mm -hmm. from formal method side. But you yeah. said induction. But then you said it is completely mechanized. Right. So, I, in that talk, the first part I was talking about Proverif. And Proverif is completely mechanized. It is a horn clause based solver. Now, the SN, the, okay, one thing maybe I should have mentioned earlier in the talk is that the essential um, uh, sort of verification problem we are tackling here, which is uh, with an unbounded attacker, is undecidable, instantly undecidable actually. So it's very quick, easy to prove that it's uh, undecidable, which means that um, uh, almost any, that all the verification tools you can consider here either are computing or doing very heavy approximations to get it into a, a, a bounded state or even, or more commonly what they do is they give up on uh, completeness. So if they say yes, there is, uh, it is secure. If they say no, there is an attack, but they may say maybe, or I don't know. And so uh, Proverif is one of the latter ones. It, uh, it can say I don't know. And then you have to use some tricks to kind of nudge it in one direction or the other. And that's up to your ingenuity. But most of the time for many of the classic protocols, it will always give you a yes or no answer. So it is very, lots of heuristics in there. So that part is completely mechanized. If you want to do crypto proofs, like a true crypto proof with probabilistic polynomial Turing machines, none of those tools are fully uh, automated. They're mechanized, but not automated. So you have to give them hints on how to do the, how to do the proof. Now, when you get to code, like the one I was showing you for the crypto code, that's why we're using F star and the Fiat crypto group in, in MIT uses uh, Coq, and there are some people who use some other tools. And there, it's a choice between how much automation you want to get um, so if you, in our case, we use F-star because we can get some automation out of the SMT solver, which F-star uses. In Coq, you don't, you do it via tactics and so on, but you get a more, a smaller trusted computing base. So there, depends on what your, uh, what your choices are. But people have been using all kinds of tools for these uh, harder problems. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the keyword and what I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. is how big the trusted computing base mm -hmm. is and does it have to descend all the way into hardware? That's right. So, uh, like the, the crypto library I showed you, uh, Hackle Star, is in C. Okay. C is already like a big distance from assembly. So, we say, okay, if you really care about that, you should use ComCert and then you can get down to assembly. Okay, you can get down to assembly. But it still doesn't account for any of the micro architectural attacks like Spectre and Meltdown that came up last year. In fact, none of the libraries, crypto libraries out there, is secure against them right now because they completely break our abstraction of what the hardware itself is. So there is more work going on now after Meltdown and Spectre of people trying to link uh, like the RISC-V architecture or no more novel designs like Sherry and, uh, and other things from uh, the University of Cambridge then take a formal model of what the hardware is supposed to do and then link it up. Uh, and that's very fresh and cool area to work on. Uh, but we don't have the answers yet, I'd say. Um, so my 
my question is about Proverif. So it must use some kind of decision procedure to actually go through all the combinations and find out that their attacker cannot obtain the, the message, let's say. Um, and I remember somebody was, was talking about a similar tool, and my question there was, and so that's the question for Proverif as well, is that do you um, translate this down to uh, something like a CNF, like a, that, that I can use a standard tool for it, or did you hand code your own decision procedure? And the reason that I'm asking this question is because if you do actually do, like translate it to SAT, then what you can do is you say, well, obviously you're looking for onset, so yep. usually that's how you work. And then if it's an onset, then a SAT server will actually give you a proof, a proof trace, which tells you actually which parts of the protocol are completely useless. Because of course, if the proof trace doesn't actually contain parts of a proof, I mean parts of the protocol, that means that part of the protocol, protocol was completely useless to prove that the, ma the attacker cannot. So basically you can, potentially remove messages from the protocol, therefore shortening it, mm -hmm. um, without losing any guarantees that you want to provide. Right. Now that's a very interesting uh, idea. So there are two or three tools that do compile down from protocol descriptions like the one I showed you to SMT. And then they do try to use pruning. They also try to use, uh, like Z3 will give you a counterexample which you can then reconstruct into an attack, for example. So. Uh, there are lots of interesting things you can do once you're using these uh, off-the-shelf tools. Um, Proverif, on the other hand, is sort of highly focused on uh, crypto protocols. So what it does is that it has its, uh, it, okay, at the underlying it is a standard horn clause resolution algorithm uh, with selection, where the selection is actually programmable. But okay, it's, a, it's nothing you wouldn't have seen 20 years ago in some sense. But the heuristics that are going into it are all about how to use the selection procedures to kind of guide it in a certain way. And as part of those selection procedures and heuristics, it is trying to prune by figuring out dependencies. But it does this in a way where it uses the structure of the protocol and what it knows about how these protocols usually go to really encode a lot of heuristics. And other tools with that have tried to do this in a more generic way by just compiling to SMT2 or something have, and losing a lot of structure in the process have struggled to, to kind of handle the complexity because the resulting formulas tend to be too big and this uh, has, be, has been a limiting factor. So as, I mean, we use both SMT and, uh, and Proverif, so, but, and I, I'm seeing such big advancements now in, in the last few years in SMT that it might be the case that soon we may not need all of these special heuristics and we might be able to use something more generic, but it's not yet clear, I would say, in that, in that field. The, the custom decision procedures are doing better still, uh, significantly better. For the questions, it's not the case, so then let's link again, that's it.